Hello, and welcome to our series, Career Resilience, where we talk with people about their career path and their career journey. Maybe we can all learn from each other. My name is Jan Daniluk, and I'm a human resources professional in London, Ontario, Canada. I work with Ford Keast LLP, and I work with my clients to help them with the HR side of their business. We hope that you will enjoy these discussions with real people about real challenges and real working life situations. Welcome. My guest today is John Kadelka. John, welcome to Career Resilience. Really appreciate having you here. Thank you. It's, uh, you're, uh, you've been very helpful over the years answering all my questions, so I'm happy to return the favor. For that. Um, so, John, can we start with what you do? Because I find it quite fascinating what you do, and I have a lot, a lot of questions to ask you. So, so tell me what you do. Uh, I am the owner of the Junction Climbing Centre, which is an indoor rock climbing facility here in London, Ontario, in the Old East Village. We have um, a 12,000 square foot building. Uh, we've got roughly 110 or 20 different climbs at any given time. Um, and we're a business that uh, is open for uh, sort of split between memberships and people who do this as their main recreation and also sort of people who pay for a day pass and come in uh, just to kind of come in and have fun or also uh, kids camps, kids programs, birthday parties, um, okay. all your vertical climbing needs. All your vertical climbing needs. How did you get into this business? What is your background that led you to this business? Uh, the, uh, I never really fit well in, into sort of standard sport. Um, I always felt like, uh, I was never a particularly fast kid. I'm not a tall person. So I didn't really find a home in traditional team sport. And then one day I went, um, to, a uh, a, a, a climbing facility, a climbing rock climbing wall that the local scouts had. And I did this thing and I was like, I need to find a way to do this for the rest of my life. Uh, and it just, it was something there, there was no competition against another person. It was just your ability against this, this challenge. Um, that sort of interest led me to a degree in recreation. Um, I worked for years at summer camps. I worked for as an outdoor ed instructor and these were all wonderful jobs, um, but they all have the challenge that they are very seasonal. Uh, you can really, you know, you sort of, follow the work and in the summer you might be a canoe guide and then in the, the winter you might be a lifeguard and in the spring you might be working at an outdoor ed center and it, it it's it's hard to patch together a career and um after about sort of 10 or 15 years of that i was uh looking for something more stable and and recognizing that i think in today's economy it's very very difficult to save money um you know, most people are buying their house, hoping the house will accrue in value and that's going to be sort of your nest egg. Yes. And I thought, well, why don't I do that with a business as well? And then I'm kind of saving twice as much because with a business, it de develops an equity, it develops a, 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 an assets that you can then sell when you want to move on or retire. So kind of put those thoughts together into the only thing I kind of really knew um, was indoor rock climbing. And, you know, the big benefit to me is someone who'd spent so much time in the outdoors was you don't get rained on. You don't get you don't get bugs. You know you don't lose money to bad weather. You don't lose clients to to um, changing seasons. So you know the industry was one that had this sort of stability of year round income that I'd never really known before. And and climbing as a sport had been growing for twenty five years. You know the, the the first few gyms you'd see in the in the province you know were dusty warehouses. And now when you go into the, you know some of the modern gyms that he's beautiful glass lit cathedrals of climbing that's just really shown that the sport has arrived at a place of maturity that, that people really want a good experience. So that's what we tried to do when we opened Junction. Did you uh, find a particular attraction to rock climbing? You mentioned that when you first did it at the Boy Scout camp, there was something about it. What was there about it, exclusive of the business aspect that later developed? Uh, climbing is just, it's such a new sport that it's, it tends to be free. Like most of us have gone and played baseball at some point in our lives as kids and you have an association with it, good or bad. And, uh, climbing because it's so new, doesn't have the sort of cultural presence and baggage. So when you encounter it, you tend to encounter it on your own terms and you encounter it in a way that's not, um, 
you know, it's just, it's just a very pure, simple sport. I mean, we all love climbing as kids. Like we all love going up things and climbing returns us to that. Uh, it's a wonderful sport um, as well, because it's a rare sport that allows anyone of any ability to play and do it together without having to be the same ability. So, you know, uh, two friends can go and one can be athletic and one can be non-athletic and they'll have an equally good time because it's not about like, in, you know, in tennis, if you play someone who's better than you, it sucks. But even if somebody's good at tennis, if you play someone who's not as good at you, it sucks. And if, in skiing, you end up like skiing separately because people want to do the hard hills or the easy hills. And, and in climbing, you kind of bring everyone together in the same room and you can have parents with kids, you can have, you know, uh, you know, male and female, you can have all the, all the mix of people in a space enjoying the sport. And that's pretty unique. Um, and it's, it's honestly, it's pretty affordable um, compared to a lot of sports. It's not, the gear's not expensive, um, you know, compared to, to, you know, it's membership is in line with a member of being part of any other gym. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Is it a growing sport? Is there any competition uh, around wall climbing? Uh, I mean, in London, we're the only facility like this. Um, it is absolutely a growing sport. When I started this seven years ago, I started researching this in 2009, and the number of climbing gyms in Ontario have doubled in that time. There's usually three or four new gyms opening a year. Um, the average facility size, like, in, in, you know, when I started, Junction would have been considered a big facility. Now we're kind of average or medium sized. In the U.S., there's gyms being built 40 and 50,000 square feet. Uh, it's in the Olympics which is a huge thing for our sport to be um, recognized as, a, as something that should be, should be there. Has anybody ever been stuck on a wall or, or had vertigo when they were halfway up or any of those kinds of things, John? Yeah, so the, the systems, the, the, there's sort of two styles of climbing. There's the, there's the big walls, which we call routes, and that's what most people think of. And there's the little wall we call the boulder. And the boulder is more of a, uh, sort of shorter, intense version. And the safety systems on the big walls um, are set up so that you really can't get stuck. If you are fearful, afraid, you know, uh, in some kind of emergency, um, you let go and you get lowered down. And it's, it's really set up to not keep you at risk. There was one incident where on the boulder, we you could kind of scramble on top and we had a guy who went up there and he couldn't get down because um, he was having an episode where he hadn't, uh, you know, eaten all day and then too, too much exercise and felt faint, but we gave him a granola bar and it was, it was all fine. <laughs> so you got a granola bar up to him. We have, yeah, we did. We had an emergency granola bar in our, in our, <laughs> in our first aid kit. <laughs> when you were first, again, getting into this, did you have a mentor or how did you, did you just sort of make your own way? Uh, I was very fortunate to connect with um, the, uh, owner of the Guelph Grotto. So I, I actually lived in Guelph at the time and um, kind of reached out to him. He, his name is Dave Ferroso and he's had a gym in Guelph since 1994. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing I'd be doing it in London because London had the room in the market um, and knowing I didn't have the experience in some of the sort of more obscure parts of the business, um, reached out to him and I've really been fortunate to benefit from his um his investment, his expertise, and his, um, uh, you know, just sort of general wisdom around all things climbing. Um, how long has it been an Olympic sport? It will be the, the first Olympics will be the ones coming up. Oh. Um, and they've already added a second medal for the next Olympics. So there was a one medal sport and now it's a two medal sport in the next Olympics. Okay, got it. And will the walls in the Olympics be a lot taller than the walls, for instance, at Junction Climbing? Uh, not really. Um, a, a little bit. There's there's sort of three disciplines to Olympic climbing. Um, I already mentioned we have bouldering and, and routes, and those are two of the disciplines. Um, and then the third discipline is called speed. And speed is a, very, is a defined course that you go up as the fastest possible time, which will be incredible fun to watch um, when it's on TV um because it's pretty uh it's pretty intense how do you put yourself out there so that people are aware of this kind of still somewhat unique sport uh i mean i think i think there's a yeah, i think it's been pretty well and I, I don't have anything to back this up specifically but i know i've read articles that talk about how the the people's 
way of doing leisure and people's way of concern of spending their money is shifted away from things towards experience. People want to buy experiences now. They, they want to buy, they, they don't necessarily want to buy stuff in the same way. And so we're really fortunate in that climbing provides a very meaningful, tangible, physical, accessible experience. All of us who love this sport, at some point, someone brought us in and showed us how fun this is and how rewarding and how physically challenging, and how, how, you know, and that thing for a lot of our people changed their lives, and, you know, led to them joining a sport that helped them lose weight, led to them joining a sport that helped them find community or make friends. And, you know, we have people who've met at the climbing gym and gotten married. And that's such a gift to be able to create a space where people can experience that. To, uh, as you know, this is um, a combination of sort of the, the kinds of things we do for a living and also career resilience. And mm -hmm. I can tell that throughout your career, you know, you've been thinking about what you want to do and what you want to grow into. And that's how you got to, to doing the junction climbing and owning that business. And it, I can tell you're incredibly proud of it uh, and rightly so. Um, can on the career resilience side, you and I talked about um, how when you were first starting out, it was extremely difficult. Can you speak to that for a few minutes, John? Sure. Um, I mean, I think I kind of alluded to this earlier in the in the story, but I, I was in a place where I kind of had felt my the career I was in couldn't really go forward. That I was held back by the limitations of being a seasonal in industry. And I held back also by the fact that the outdoor industry typically does not pay very well. I did a lot of research. Um, and there was a lot of industries I looked at. And when I settled on climbing as the thing I knew and loved and realized that it could be the thing if I was in this sort of indoor climbing side of it. I sat down with a, a climbing um, owner of another climbing gym. He was kind enough to set aside the time and, you know, answered my questions and talked about, you know, how to design a space and how much space you needed and all these things. And, and the one story he said is that you know, I, I, he said he'd sat down with probably 50 people and had similar conversations about starting their own gym. And that of those 50, one had actually pulled it off. Uh, and that, that gym is in Toronto. The, the one guy who pulled it off, he has a gym in, in Toronto. And, and at first I was like a little disheartened by that. And then I realized that one in 50 odds are actually pretty good odds. And the only difference between the guy who succeeded and the 49 who hadn't yet opened a gym was he hadn't stopped working on it. He actually went and kept doing the work. It wasn't that the others had failed to, he hadn't opened a gym and it closed on them. They hadn't, they just, for whatever reasons, not finished the project. And I think that was the deep lesson I took is just to keep, to keep working on it and eventually it will come. But if you stop working on it, it definitely won't come. <laughs> and, you know, when we went through, I started in 2009 is when I kind of sat down with my wife and said, I think I want to do this thing. Uh, and you know, thousands of praise, thousands of words of praise for her and her patience. I didn't open the gym until 2014. It was five years, um, and you know, there was a couple years of doing research and trying to find money and trying to find buildings and losing buildings. And every time we had a setback, you just were like, okay, well, let's just keep going. And and that that above all, like when I think of resilience, I think of that phase of trying to start things. That this thing that you know. And it's, it's embarrassing. You don't want to say you've been working on a thing for three years and have nothing to show for it. You don't want to say you've been, you've got this dream, but it's so far away that it's almost like saying, well, I'm going to be a professional, professional hockey player. Like, like that's a, it seems like, because if you, if you speak it and it seems unlikely, you feel like you're going to be at risk of being judged on that. But yeah. if you're working at that goal every day, eventually you'll get to, if not the actual goal, some version of it, that's pretty good. You know, my, London wasn't my first choice of cities. I lived in, in Guelph. I would have, you know, happily stayed in that region, but that was where the market was. And so that was where our spot was. And now we're in a great location. We're in an amazing building. We've got Anderson's Brewery next door. Like this has worked out so much better where if I limited myself to like, oh, I'm just going to stay in Guelph. Yeah. It wouldn't be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you said that you also ran into a fraudulent situation and that that uh, was extremely difficult. And I really appreciate you being willing to speak to that as well, John. Someone approached us saying um, they had the money and they were interested in being a partner. And so we quickly got plans in play. We didn't want to lose the building. We were worried about, you know, paying too much rent. And, you know, the, they got involved in like, February, by April, we kind of finished up our conversations and negotiations. 
um, and started spending money in uh, May and June and July construction started. And then by like only late August, we're like, what's going on? This seems really weird. And people who said they were like, he would pay, weren't being paid. And, you know, stuff the guy said he would buy wasn't being bought. And, and, and suddenly we realized that this guy had not, he wasn't who he said he was. He was basically exploiting our eagerness and excitement to open a business to in turn use us to basically steal from the savings we had. And he was exploiting our relationship with these vendors to steal stuff for himself. And it, like, it was soul destroying because not only were we, you know, out, out tens of thousands of dollars that he'd taken out of the account, we were on the hook for all these projects, all these contractors we'd hired and were like doing the work. Like they were like, work, like you owe us for this, whether or not you finish the work. And, and we had opened our face publicly to the community to say, hey, we're opening, we've got this great design because we've got this money and we're going to build something beautiful for London. And we let all these people down. We had incredible support. We had, we had, you know, members that were like people ready to buy memberships. People had bought t-shirts. People had gone to like, you know, the council to like help support our, our rezoning. Like, like it was such a, like, that was the hardest part was letting, you know, money I can re-earn, but I can't, it's harder to build up that trust. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in six weeks from like mid August, we sort of, things seemed strange to the end of September, everything just fell apart. And suddenly we had, you know, we had contractors who were like trying to take back materials so they could get some money out of them. We had, um, uh, you know, the climbing wall people were like sending, they were there, you know, sending their workers back home to, to, to other countries. Like it was just, and like it was just, and it was a dark, dark, terrible time. And, yes. you know, we, we were committed that we knew the idea could work and the solution when we dealt, dealt with this, the end solution was um, to still keep working on it, to not give up. And when we approached those people who were like all the, the, the trades and the landlord and the, and the people who were out money is to say, like, you've got two choices, you can bankrupt us, which you're entitled to do because <laughs> we don't, we're not paying you. Um, but maybe give us just a few more months to figure this out. We are, as you know, we are wanting to make this right and we believe in this and you know they going to them with that kind of radical honesty of like we are we have nothing but your trust please trust us that we're gonna make this right every one of them said okay you've got you've got some time yeah. and, and getting them all on board together and saying you help us see this through you're gonna see something you're gonna I would say things like, yeah, like you're going to see this amazing facility for climbers. And they were like, I don't care. I want to see my money. Um, but they, 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 they all got on board and we had built just enough to get, to show the vision and to show that it was workable. Yeah. And so, you know, we kept looking for new investors. We kept looking for, um, uh, you know, we changed the design of the building. So it was smaller and we didn't need to find as much money. We um, did a lot more work ourselves instead of paying contractors. We, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, a year late we opened and it was, you know, it would have been very easy to walk away and, and just throw our hands up and say, ah, it's too hard. And yeah. was there a moment that you thought of that? <sighs> there were, honestly, that seemed worse, you know, that it, it was never a moment where that seemed like the right choice. You know, we certainly thought of like, what happens if we give up on this? Well, we'll probably get a bunch of letters from lawyers saying you owe us money and we'll probably be in court a bunch of times, you know, or we could go in and frame the bathrooms. <laughs> so let's go frame the bathrooms. <laughs> so, much better. so much better. So what happened when you confronted this investor? Uh, this person who did later actually go to jail for this fraud and others. Um, what let this person kind of exploit us was we were so keen to be, um, we were just so excited to have something that they would promise things that in a vague enough way that we would project our hopes on that. Mm -hmm. So um, when once we kind of had our, you know, and, and, and they would play games where they would, they would, um, you know, promise to, they would take money out to say they paid someone but they took them out in cash and they would just say, yeah, yeah, so-and-so wants it in cash. And that's not uncommon for trades to say, can you pay me in cash? 
So, but that trip money would go out in cash. It wouldn't go to the trade. It would go to the guy. And, and, you know, when you look through the books and you realize how much, what was actually happening, and it only took six weeks is the amazing part. Um, you know, once we just confronted him and said, we don't want you part of this business, you're not good for us. And if you talk to us again, we will have you charged. And I think he knew his game was up and he moved on to his next, his next fraud. Like, I think this was, he, he didn't really push. He tried to push back a little bit, but in the end it was, it was, um, the weight of evidence on our side was enough that when we showed that card to say, this is what's going on. And once the blinders were off for us, that the hopes we were projecting on him weren't going to be satisfied. We were able to, yeah, we were able to, to, to see through anything he said at that point, we just didn't believe. Did that experience uh, change you in any way or like continue to affect you in any way? Um, I think, I mean, there's certainly sort of scars on the business from that, the, you know, because we didn't have investor money, we ended up debt financed. We're paying a lot of debt. You know, I would never wanted to finance it, but you know, the, the, you know, the debt ratio in our business is something that is very burdensome and will be for a while. Um, we're very fortunate that we've been able to pay it since we opened. Um, there's parts of the building that aren't, you know, are unfinished or changed or modified that aren't the way I had built them because but we had to build them that way at the time. Um, and so some of that is there. I think there's definitely a sense of like, um, there are also things like good things that came out of it. Um, you know, I have one less business partner. That's one less person to share the money with. So when this is kind of a, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, there is definitely a, um, you know, there's a high importance I place now in paying all my suppliers on time and paying, you know, I don't want to be known still as the person who didn't pay. There is, there is, um, there is a, uh, a skepticism of getting involved with future partners and how that could go. That's maybe affecting mm -hmm. how I think about growth in the business to do it yeah. with someone else. Yeah. Um, there's a certain pride that we pulled it off, you know, throughout that difficulty so it's a bit it's sort of complicated and it's a good question i think i'd have to kind of think deeper in terms of like where it's where it's still affecting me in terms of that yeah that mm -hmm. difficulty that experience yeah i think that that uh, kind of experience which we've all had at some level um but when you've put your heart and soul into a business and for so many years, and you had such a goal that I, I think you would have to be an extremely strong person to, you know, continue and, and recognize that you had your eyes on the prize always. Well, and I, I, that is absolutely the truth. And I have often compared it to being in a bad relationship, you know, that, that this person manipulated us and abused us in probably ways that were very similar to that type of thing. Yeah. And so the question is, can you, can you, like, you're never going to be healed, like unhurt or undamaged after that, but are you better and stronger and more understanding of your own things? Mm -hmm. And I think that absolutely is a, is a truth. So I wanted to end off by you telling me three reasons why someone who hasn't climbed should consider getting into climbing. Okay. I'm going to try to avoid the basic ones like it's fun. I think if you are into climbing, it's not just a ladder that you go up. You know, there is an incredible range and sequence of movements and positions, some of them incredibly subtle. And so as little as turning your right, your ankle left or right can change the whole sequence of movement. And I think people who are attracted to problem solving um, will find themselves engaged in figuring out how to do a climb and then changing it so how you can do it even more efficiently. I think that has a real appeal for um, uh, logic brain people. It's much more of a much more solution driven than you might expect. I think um, the the uh, what's what's beautiful about our type of business is that you can do it on your schedule and with your people so 
anyone who's played hockey knows how hard it is to find a goalie. Anyone who plays baseball is like, oh my gosh, getting nine people on a field at the same time is a nightmare. You know, that with climbing, you can go with whoever's available. You can go if no one's available and go at the time you want, leave when the time you want. There is a, there is a, it's not even like, you know, skiing where you have, or bowling where you have to book a lane. Like you can, you can just go and do it. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, you know, that is a thing that makes, that works well in the economy of today where people don't have pretty, you know, our schedules are pretty messed up and you can bring your kids or you can leave the kids at home, whatever works for you. Yeah. I think the third reason is we are located beside Anderson Craft Ales and they have the wonderful EOA um, food, uh, people doing food inside. And uh, even if it's not that great, you can go to the brewery and have an amazing meal next door afterwards. So support those local businesses uh, if yeah. you're, uh, yeah. you, you can have a place to go afterwards, that's great. Right, you can go next door and debrief. You can go next door, yeah. Cool, your hands will be all sore and hold the cold beer or, or other beverage. <laughs> and the food, if you don't drink, the food there is fantastic. Uh, and if you don't like their beer, you can go two blocks over to London Brewing. And if you don't like their beer, you can go four more blocks to Powerhouse, who also has excellent food. So <laughs> you are well suited in that regard. John, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you hearing my stories. Yeah, great stories and incredible perseverance. And I, I love that, that you were never taking a look at the short term, you are willing to look out at the longer term. And in a world where instant gratification is uh, very much the norm, um, you, you moved away from that and thought it through. And, and that's something to really, really be admired and something to really be proud of. So good for you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> to our viewers and our listeners, thank you very much for joining John and I today. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Also, we are on YouTube now. I hope that you will subscribe and follow us on Spotify if you're a listener rather than a viewer and uh, subscribe on Apple Podcasts if that's where you get your podcast. So thank you very much for being with us today and until we meet again. <laughs>